This is the Construction Leading Edge podcast from ConstructionLeadingEdge.com and BuilderMasterclass.com. My name is Todd DeWalt. It's my job to help you eliminate chaos, maximize profits in your construction business. And I've got a great interview with you for you today with my good friend Spencer Powell. He literally wrote a book that will help you attract quality leads, increase sales, and dominate your competition. We're going to talk about that. You're going to get some really practical stuff and some things that are probably, I think, will open your eyes when it comes to lead generation marketing at your website. Here's what you're going to hear about. What Spencer Powell means when he says, the script has flipped. Also, why Spencer says you might want to become the Red Bull of the construction space. Some time wasters or mistakes that you could be making when it comes to your website and with marketing. What is a marketing funnel? Uh, We talk about an open letter that Spencer wrote to Howes and what he thinks about lead generation services like Howes and Angie's List. You'll also get some really basic practical tips on how to get started creating content for social media, for your website, the difference between design and performance of your website. We talk about a couple of genius strategies to help you start to build an ideal referral partner network, how to reposition yourself in a new market. And Spencer answers the question, what should you do if you need more leads? And his answer to that question is surprising, but really smart. A lot of great stuff in this in this episode. Highly recommend that you uh, take notes on this one. You're going to get some some good nuggets. A couple of resources and messages from my sponsors that I want to share with you before we jump into it. All right, let's talk about a form of chaos I know you've experienced before, a bad customer review. Did you know it only takes one negative review to stop a potential job in its tracks? Your reputation takes years to build. Don't let one review change that. From Yelp to Google to Facebook, GoSite helps you manage and generate reviews all in one easy-to-use place. Research shows your customers need to see at least 30 positive reviews in order to trust your brand, and top-ranking businesses on Google have an average of 40 reviews. So a job well done and a happy customer aren't just revenue, they're marketing opportunities. GoSite makes it easy to build your credibility and authority as a construction leader by automatically asking your already happy customers for a new review with just one click. Take control of your customer reviews and turn your five-star success into more revenue with GoSite's easy-to-use mobile app. Get started for free at gosite.com forward slash podcast. That's G-O-S-I-T-E dot com forward slash podcast. If you are a project manager or a superintendent on a large construction project, you know how time-consuming it can be to collect information from your field teams and subs for the all-important daily report. Many PMs and superintendents spend hours a day chasing their teams for manpower logs, safety observations, and more. Then once you collect the information, you have to sit down at your desk or in your truck, manually enter the data into your project management system. Then if you have questions or if something's missing, you have to send text messages or emails or make calls. And then when you put this all together, it gets pretty chaotic. If that sounds like you, I'm here to tell you there's a better way. Field Chat is purpose-built to help you communicate and collect important information from your field teams and subcontractors. With Field Chat, You don't have to chase people down for visitor sign-ins, COVID assessments, safety orientations, toolbox talks, RFIs, safety observations, JHAs, hot work permits, manpower logs, and a lot more. Field Chat will chase everyone for you by using scheduled text messages or QR codes around the job site to collect the information you need. And because your field crews and subs already know how to use text and QR codes, they won't have anything new to download or learn. And if you have questions or need to send updates, you can use Field Chat to communicate with everyone via SMS text, all from one organized and searchable app. All of the data is auto-synced with your project management tools like Procore and PlanGrid, helping to save you hours a day and improving your documentation, keeping your company protected and your owners happy. Start your free trial today over at fieldchat.com. 
dot com forward slash edge and see how it feels to eliminate paper data entry and communication chaos on your projects that's fieldchat.com forward slash edge all right without further ado here is my conversation with my good friend spencer powell enjoy spencer powell welcome back to the podcast how are you doing today i'm doing good yeah i'm glad glad to be back yeah, so we've we've done some cross pollination. I've been on yours. You've been on mine. It's been a while since you you've been on on my podcast. So since then, you've been a pretty busy guy. You wrote a book that we're going to talk about that we're going to dig into. It's the Remodeler Marketing Blueprint: How to Attract Quality Leads, Increase Sales, and Dominate Your Competition. So we'll talk about some of the topics in the book and then we'll dig into some really practical stuff. But here's where I want to start is at the beginning of the book, you say the script has flipped. What do you mean by that? Yeah. I mean, really, I just thought it was a nice rhyme to kick off the book. So it doesn't actually have any meaning at all. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, basically, you know, if, if you kind of rewind in time and you think about your buying process, um, I, I always just think of something super easy. Like, let's say you're going to buy a TV. You'd go down to like a Circuit City or a Best Buy or something, and and you'd go talk to a salesperson, you know, and, and you could look at some stuff on the racks and everything. But really, the salesperson had all the information. Same with like, if you think about a car buying experience, you used to have to just go on to the lot, like talk to somebody. They'd have all the details about pricing and discounts and upgrades and blah, 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 blah. And so if you think about the entire process from starting the marketing to actually closing a deal, you kind of go through marketing, you go through research, you get to the sales process, you're talking to a salesperson, and then you close a deal. The old way, you would really start the process. You'd maybe see an ad or you'd go, oh, I need this thing well, now I better go reach out to some companies and talk to some people. So you'd talk to the salesperson very early on, whereas today it's totally flipped. Right now we go online, we do our research, and you can do about 80 or 90% of your research. And then you go talk to a salesperson, they kind of take you that last mile, you know, especially when we're talking about, you know, remodeling, custom building, you know, anything in the home improvement space, like you're not just going to click buy it online like you do on Amazon. But people still do that research. So that's really what we've seen is, okay, the script is flipped. The, the salesperson doesn't have all the power and all the information, and all the cards anymore. You know, people do, the consumer do, it does. Yeah. So what does, what does that mean? What does that mean to remodelers and builders in really practical terms? Yeah. It really means you have to rethink marketing, hmm. you know? So if, if we take the old way, marketing's job was to produce awareness and generate some interest and drive some sales conversations. But it was really just like, hey, I want to get in front of these people and get them right into the sales process as fast as possible because that's where everything kind of starts. You know, whereas today you have people that are doing research for months years, you know, bookmarking sites, browsing portfolios, looking on Pinterest and Instagram, different websites and blogs. And so if you think about that from a marketing perspective, you actually have a huge opportunity to jump into that research process in the early innings of that person's journey. And then you can be a part of their journey so that when they're actually at that point of, okay, I want to talk to some companies now, you've actually got a leg up because you've been there, you've been educating them, you've been helping them, they're aware of you. And so I think that's a massive opportunity for people that embrace that and go, okay, I can't really control the way people shop and buy. I'm going to acknowledge that it's different. And then I'm going to change the way I do marketing to just match up with that. Yeah. I I watched a, a marketing guru talk about a different approach to marketing and he used this analogy. He had this, bowl full of like lifesavers. And he said, he dumped them out on the table and he said, this is your market. And he swiped out about 10% of the market. And he said, these people are never going to buy from you. They're just never going to buy. They're not going to buy from either. They're never going to buy or they're never going to buy from you. So he swiped those off the table. Then he took another 20%. And he said, these are the people that are ready to buy today. 
and they are looking to buy something today. And, and he said, most people, most of your competition are marketing to these people, these 20%. And they're like, buy now, buy today. And he said, but that leaves a big chunk of the market out there that are interested. They're going to buy sometime, but not today. And very few people are talking to that big chunk, that big pile of, of lifesavers in his example. And that's what his advice was. So I, that's, I think it's a really important distinction that, yes, there are people who are ready to buy today, but the majority of the market is, is not ready to buy today. And you really want to market to that group. Well, both you want to market to both groups, but the biggest opportunity, as you said, is let's get into that the journey early on and not try to sell people today. So we're not saying, hey, call me for an estimate, come buy something. We're saying here's some really valuable, valuable content, which we're going to get into marketing funnels and um, lead generation and some other things as we go through this. And, and one distinction, I know you wrote the book for remodelers, but as a guy who works with a lot of home builders, a lot of general contractors, and for that matter, contractors of all types, the, the principles and strategies you talk about for content marketing and building funnels and getting people to know, like, and trust you really apply no matter what you're selling. So this, th these strategies, this interview and this book is really valuable no matter what you're doing. Um, so we're a couple of content marketers, right? Mm -hmm. That's absolutely. I, I have a podcast to, for those people who are listening and you're like, what is content marketing? Well, you're listening to it. And Spencer, you have a couple of podcasts, create a lot of content and it's, it's a great way to get people to, to get to know you, get to like you and get to trust you. Um, all right, so let's go back to the book. There's a section at the end of your book that says, become the Red Bull of the construction space. What does that mean? Yeah, so, you know, in, in thinking about content marketing, what you were just talking about, you know, podcasts as content, blog as content, video as content, those are just different mediums. But as you think about what's being produced, it's typically educational, entertaining, you know, something where you're, you're saying, okay, I'm going to put some content in front of somebody and I'm trying to build some no like, and trust, like you just said. So I was looking around at some different, uh, different other industries. I find sometimes you can really get some golden nuggets from other industries and go, Hey, could we apply that to our industry? So you look at Red Bull, most people know Red Bull and, and obviously they know the drink, but they typically think of, you know, the crazy skateboard stunts or the snowboarding video or, um, you know, the, the moon drop or, you know, whatever it was. Um, it was a big stunt, right? That's Red Bull Media. Now, Red Bull Media is just their, they're basically their <clears throat> media and marketing arm for Red Bull. They do about $50 million a year in revenue, just the media company. And it produces, I think it's in like $2 billion worth of sales of Red Bull products. And I got to thinking about that and I'm going, this is genius. They basically have created a, uh, an arm of their company that produces so much brand awareness and other sales, but that division is probably profitable or even if it's break even, they're literally getting free marketing because they're actually getting sponsorship deals and different things, you know, 50 million in revenue for, for whatever they're spending. Um, and so I just started to think about that. I'm going, you know, this is a great industry for that. And, and you start to see it with guys like uh, Matt Reisinger, he's got the build show and you start thinking, you know, you're going, yeah, there's only probably a few of them out there. But if you take that concept, like you can get sponsors from product suppliers, manufacturers, if you have really good content and now suddenly you're getting paid to do your own marketing for your own lead gen and your own business. So I just love that, that concept. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. It's, and it's a little, it's an indirect play. Mm -hmm. I think it, it requires a little different viewpoint. So it's not, I think when uh, a lot of people consider marketing, they think, well, it has to be about me and my company and the work I do. And what we're talking about is, 
let's create content that attracts your potential customers and um, get them to to be aware of us and and, and just be attractive. It can be entertaining. It may not actually be anything about your company, but if you can attract people and get eyeballs and get subscribers and uh, build your audience, I, I think that's a good thing. So you mentioned Matt Reisinger and he does a great job. I know he has a separate media company, but mm-hmm. what um, if someone, let's say somebody's a, a, let's look at a couple of different examples and we can just kind of riff on this. If somebody's a remodeling contractor or a custom home builder, first of all, let's, let's put together a framework of how to think about this. I see a lot of people who are putting content out there who that is interesting to them you know, they they talk about like this is my I got this new festool whatever and look at my truck setup and here's my my saw jig and and that's interesting to other remodelers but probably not that interesting to their ideal clients their prospects so when when somebody starts thinking about that's really cool I want to create some content how should they start thinking about it in, in, yeah, in it's a direction. it's a really good question. And yeah, you, you have to nail down your audience first, mm-hmm. you know, and and I think that's the part of this that people get hung up on is like, okay, you can you could create some content and then you start attracting this big audience and probably most of them are outside your area. Uh, and so you go, oh, maybe that's not really what I'm trying to do. But that actually leads you into how you might, you know, go down the media route. But let's just take an example. Let's say you are remodeler or custom builder. It's going to be a similar process. You could do your own show and you could follow the format you see on all these like auto car shows on TV where it's like customer comes in, has a problem. They talk about the problem. And then the rest of the show, the customer's out and then it's just filming them and their crew. So if you're, you know, doing a kitchen remodel, interview the customer, they come in, you're talking about like what they hate about their kitchen, they're trying to open it up, they wanna invite more people over, whatever it is, and then boom, they're out of it, and now you're filming your crew, you run into some issues, you add a little drama, you know, and then boom, at the end, it's amazing, you pull it off right at the deadline, you know, you kinda, you're thinking about it a little more from like a storytelling standpoint than you would um, otherwise. But I mean, that would be a kind of a simple concept for a, a show, you know, and you start thinking about content and brand and you're going, okay, you could do, you know, a little, um, you know, ABC remodeler original mini series. And there you go. You just film a little bit with the customer and mostly your team and you kind of tell a story. It could be a 10 minute, 20 minute thing. Um, but start looking around for examples. Like you see all these dream home makeover or even HGTV as much as we hate it because of the um, warped perception it gives on price. Like that's what they're doing. They're just filming what they already do. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to do anything different. You're just documenting the process, but you have the homeowner in mind. So they don't care about the, the latest tool. Like you said, they care about how ugly it was and how amazing they made it look in this certain amount of time, you know, that went by and what the process was, all those types of things. Yeah. And I think the the key distinction is let's start with the customer. Who's the target audience? <clears throat> what do they care about? And what I've advised people to do is if you want, if you want to create valuable content, then go address their pressing concerns. What are they afraid of? So what I've told people, for example, I had a conversation with a remodeler who did a lot of basement remodels. And I said, what, what's one of the biggest questions that people have about remodeling their basement? And he said, well, how are, how are you going to get into my house? How are you going to keep my house secure? Um, how are you going to keep my upstairs clean while you're remodeling the basement? So like, there, there's a, a fear or a concern. Then my advice is go out to a job site, walk around and say, hey, this is Steve from ABC Remodeling. And one of the biggest questions people have is, how do you keep my house secure? So here's how we do it. We swap out the lock set at the top of the steps so that it's secure from upstairs. We never go upstairs. Here's how we handle dust containment. Hey, here's a picture of Michael over here putting up some um, some plastic. We use filters, three to five minutes of just walking around using the phone to, to video that stuff. You have great content that addresses a concern and is really high value. And it, it 
it really doesn't say, I think the key is that it says very little about your company. It's not mm -hmm. all about you. It's all about them. And when yeah. you do that, then you will attract the right, right kind of people. And I love your example there because it's one simple, it's two, you're just telling stuff that you already know and do, you know, your customer doesn't know that you know it. And so sometimes we get hung up there. You have to just think about, okay, I'm just going to answer these basic questions. Uh, and then the other point that you made, which is really good is don't get hung up on production. Yes. You know, the production value, it's the content value. So use your phone, document it, like get it out there is, is better than just getting hung up on. It has to be this fancy edited, polished thing. Yeah. That becomes overwhelming. And, and you're yeah. right that there's this curse of knowledge um, mm -hmm. you've been doing it for one year, 20 years. And you're like, well, everybody knows how, uh, how to prove how you have to insulate the inside of the wall. Everybody knows where the, the vapor barrier goes. Everybody knows that. Well, no, they don't. Your customers, one of the best things I heard was there was a, a guy named, um, <laughs> Brian, who it was a kitchen and bathroom modeler who came to one of my live events. And he said something that stuck with me, which was they're not professional customers. They don't do this every day. They don't know the process. They don't know what to be concerned about. They have fears. And the best thing you can do is just take the most basic stuff. Like, and what I would tell people is, what are you doing today on a job site? Just go record three to five minutes about that today. Just get started putting it out there. And that's super simple. Forget production. Don't worry about lighting. Um, you know, if you have an iPhone 3, that could be a problem. You may want to get some better quality, <laughs> but get started with what you have and just get it, get, uh, get it out there. So good advice there. Those are some, some good tips, but I'm curious, what are a couple of things that you see contractors doing that is either a mistake or just a waste of time and energy? Yeah. So let's start with a big mistake and, and well, and I guess it's, it's kind of a waste of time too, some, in some cases. So the big, I don't know if it's the biggest, but it's a big mistake and it is, you have a website, you maybe redesigned it a couple of years ago and now you're going, all right, let's, let's really do this web marketing thing. Like it's time to get some leads going we're going to reach out to some companies and we're going to redo our website. So there's this perception that redoing your website all of a sudden magically brings in leads. And so what I like to talk about is this difference between design and performance. Design is the way it looks, the way it feels, the way somebody can navigate through it. Performance is how many people are actually getting to the website, how many people are filling out forms and becoming leads and, you know, interested prospects. And so if you're sitting out there and you have a website and it looks pretty good, you know, it's not way from the 90s, it's not junk, it's not garbage, you've got good photos on there, it's presentable, it, pre it represents your brand well. Don't all of a sudden just say, okay, let's redo our website and expect to magically get leads because you go through, you know, three, six, nine months of redoing the website, you spend thousands or maybe even in the tens of thousands of dollars, and then you launch and the exact same thing is happening. You're still getting no traffic and no leads. So my recommendation there is work on website performance first, and then maybe consider design down the road or make some design changes. We have a, a custom builder we've worked with for about nine years and we took over their website as is i thought it was pretty ugly looking at the time but they didn't want to redesign it they're like we just want to do the marketing thing i said all right like we'll get rolling we can look at that down the road we've looked at it we've looked at it we've never redesigned it this site cranks traffic and leads and that that really was what triggered it for me it was going okay you can even have a site that somebody might think is not that great looking, but if the information is good, if the um, domain authority is strong and you build some equity into the site, you can actually still get a lot of traffic and leads. And so there is, there is a place for design, but um, I say start with performance first. Gotcha. Um, what is, so a waste of time would be spending a lot of money on your website, 
taking the the field of dreams philosophy of if you build it, it will come. <laughs> it's a perfect analogy for this situation. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sorry to say they're not going to find you organically. A few may stumble across you, but you, you, they're, if you build it, they probably won't care. They won't, they won't know. No, they won't um, know. Yeah. <laughs> any other mistakes or wastes of time that you see yeah. making? Yeah. So this one may sting, but, uh, social media mm. and I, and I say this and I'll, I'll add some depth to it. So the way I've come to see social media is you kind of in a couple of camps. Camp one is, Hey, I know social media is important and I know my customers, my prospects, they're going to find me and they're probably going to go check me out on social media. So it's very important for me to have a good presence there, be active, and they can kind of get to know me. They can see some projects, maybe see a couple of videos of me and my team or some pictures, get to know us and say, hey, this is a real company. They've posted within the last week or two, like they're not, you know, gone off the face of the earth. So that's more of the using social media to verify and maybe build a little bit of brand. Camp two is I really want to generate some leads from social media. If you want to be in that camp, you have to spend a lot of time. You're probably going to have to spend an hour a day, maybe more, you know, posting, commenting, liking, searching hashtags, you know, tagging other companies. I mean, you're going to have to be active and that's how you can grow a real presence and a following, expand your reach. But if you're just posting twice a week, you shouldn't expect that to happen. You know, it's just too competitive and too noisy. Uh, and so I think the the waste of time is that people spend a lot of time with the wrong expectation. They're like, I've, I've been posting, I've been doing all these things, but I'm not getting any leads. Well, that's probably because you're in camp one. Camp one is great, like post, but then just say, hey, I'm not trying to crank the leads here. I'm just trying to be present and knowing that probably Google and some other channels are really your, your lead generators. We look at data across the country. We have lots of different clients and so we actually get to see real data on all their websites. Social media is not a top lead generator. It's an influencer of the sale. It's an influencer of building that relationship. So I think there's just a misconception around getting a lot of leads from social. Yeah. Yeah, that makes makes perfect sense. Um, so it's about understanding and getting clear on what's the purpose. So it's about awareness. It's about staying in front of people. But if you're posting twice a week, don't expect people to click through. Uh, and here's an, an interesting point. Uh, I've seen a lot of people who they're pretty active on Instagram, but if you look at their, if somebody were to say, you know what, I want to contact ABC Remodeling, there's no link in their profile. It's like, that's rough. <laughs> how do I find these? Like, do I have to send you a, a DM? How do I, where do I go? It's, you're spending all this time, but then you really need to think a few steps down the road. And what do I, what's the journey? Where do I want to lead these people? Um, they may love your stuff, but a good question is, can they, can they find me? How do they actually contact me? Or have you looked at your, your, uh, your DMS to see if you're, you're getting it. Um, all right. So we talked, we talked a little bit there about lead generation. I know you have some strong feelings about hows and uh, how specifically, but how do you feel about lead gen services like hows, home advisor, Angie's list, things like that? Yeah. Yeah. That bucket. Um, so yeah, we did, we did write an open letter to house on our blog that was, um, basically called them out on a lot of stuff that I, it, we aren't happy with. You know, we're a marketing agency. We try to be an advocate for our clients in the industry, but we had heard feedback from clients too. And, um, you know, things around their pricing model or not being able to get out of contracts or not getting the type of leads or, you know, whatever was promised. And um, he, here's my feeling on them. Generally, I think they are commoditizing the industry a little bit because they're training the homeowner to get three, four, five, six bids or whatever it is. Like, hey, I'll just submit my info and I'll get a whole bunch of info back and I'll just pick one of these numbers that's the lowest or somewhere in the middle because that feels better or however they make their buying decisions. Um, and so I don't think that's doing a good job of training 
the end customer, the, the homeowner and, and what we want there. Um, however, that being said, at the end of the day, if you're using one of these services, all I want people to do is evaluate the channel and see if it's working for you. You know, so it, you know, is it driving traffic and is it driving leads and is it driving them at a cost per lead that works for your business? I will never tell somebody to stop doing something that's working really well for them. Um, you know, so my general sentiment on those sites is I would much prefer you take control of your own lead generation than rely on these sites because two years from now, they could totally change, you know, tomorrow they could totally change, you know, and so you're kind of at the whim of all of those types of things, whether it's pricing, quality of lead, cost per lead. Um, and I just generally don't like that they're training the homeowner to go after six or seven bids. Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm a a big advocate for getting paid for estimates, so especially for remodelers, custom home builders, general yes. contractors. You should be charging for planning and detailed estimates. I'm not talking about ballpark budgeting, but one of the biggest root causes of problems, um, well, the biggest root cause of problems for a lot of remodelers is they're spending so much time doing free estimates and then even on the contracts that they get from a free estimate, there are a lot of profit bleeds that can be traced back to, oh, well, we missed that during the estimate because we had to put it, put a, an allowance or a plug number, or we just missed it. So my advice is don't, don't do free estimates. And if somebody is saying, hey, we'd like a price, here's our set of plans, we want a price, probably not the best customer because that is, I can look a homeowner in the eye and say, the two biggest threats, the two biggest risks to your project right now are the free estimate and the lack of upfront planning. And that is the path you're headed down if you're collecting six or seven bids. So yeah, good I think point. it's, it, it's I, I've, I've heard from some people who have gotten zero business from house and they've decided how they want to use it. I've heard from some people who get most of their business from house. So I, I'm with you. Don't, reject something out of hand. Don't do it just because somebody else is doing it, but just try it out. Do, run some experiments and actually make some decisions based on, on data mm -hmm. um, and, and be clear on what you want to do. So yeah. And that, that open letter, if you just Google open letter to house, I like that. Here's how you're commoditizing the construction industry. Did you, uh, did you get a response from them? <laughs> no, but we definitely got a lot of uh, cheers from from remodelers and contractors and people commenting and basically just acknowledging a lot of the stuff that we said. They said, yep, this is my experience too, and that sort of thing. Um, I interviewed the CEO of a, it's not a new service, but it was new to me. It's a company called Sweeten, S-W-E-E-T-E-N. Um, Gene Brownhill is the CEO, and they are like a matchmaker service for remodeling contractors in certain markets. And it's I like their model. It's it's very different. But if you're if you're in a big metro area, then check out Sweeten.com, or you can just listen to episode 184. I think it's 184 of my podcast, where Gene and I talk about um, a lot of things, including including her business. Um, all right, so let's get practical. Let's look at a few different situations for contractors. There are a lot of people listening to this. Some are experienced, some are just getting started. And I'm a big fan of getting the 80 for the 20. There are probably, not probably, in just about all cases, there's 20% of the things you can focus on to get 80% of the value. So I'm curious for three different scenarios, I'd like to get your take on what should people be focused on? In the first situation, the first bucket of contractors is we're getting ready to launch the business. We're like at zero or in the, in the first year of business and we don't have, we don't have much of anything. Maybe we don't have a website, but if we're just getting ready to launch, where would you advise people to focus their efforts? Yeah. So if it were me and I was just starting, I mean, you, you got to get a website up, even if it's just basic. So, I mean, you, you just can't dodge that bullet today. People expect that they're going to, even if they see you see a sign, they're going to Google you and try to find some info. So you got to get that up. Um, 
And then I'd probably focus on uh, a couple of areas. I mean, one, you, I'm thinking, okay, lower costs, you're just starting up. So Canvas, very specific neighborhoods that you want to work in and get hyper, hyper focused. Say this is where we want to be. And then you land a first job, you get signage in there, you have your trucks branded in there, like get the visibility in a very tight area. Uh, so that would be one suggestion. And then in terms of um, relationships, I would start reaching out to other partner companies. Um, I, I did a video recently on power partnerships. So maybe exploring, you know, landscaping, Come if you're an interior remodeler, landscapers and outdoor, and maybe giving them a commission if they send you work and figuring out a little partnership program, because chances are you may don't have a lot of relationships. So I'd maybe start working that angle. And then online, the long-term play is always organic search, but you're gonna you have no equity on the site, so you're gonna look at like Google paid ads. And again, I would be very very tightly focused, maybe just kitchens. You know, even if you do kitchens, baths, additions, and pick one thing and focus on that and drive them to a specific page on your website that has information about that same thing, like kitchens. So. I know there's a few things, but I feel like you 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 know you you got a few things to do. You, you can ignore a lot of the other things, but I, I feel like that starts to build some inroads in a few different areas for you. Yeah, I, I think you have. To, I agree. You, you have to have a home base, someplace mm -hmm. to send people to, and and I'm a big fan of referral partners, and that's that's where I advise people to go. If if you want, if you're just getting started out, then you need to. You can either go try to develop relationships with customers one at a time, or you can go focus on developing relationships with referral partners, people who have access to consistent deal flow. They get some value out of having a relationship with you and they are not a competitor. So for remodelers, it could be somebody who um, is a landscaper or it's a, perhaps a trade contractor. Maybe it's somebody who does, who draws house plans or mm -hmm. an interior designer. Interior designers are, are really good referral partners in some situation because they need a good contractor to work with and the customer needs somebody to do the design. But think about who, my advice is think about who are my ideal customers going to first? And then let's go develop relationships with those folks. Um, yeah. All right, so that's and, good stuff. Uh, real, real quick, Todd, I, um, on that same topic, if we combine that with this idea of content marketing or even the whole Red Bull example that we use of being media, start a podcast and invite those referral partners to be on your show. And if you do a show a week, you will have done, you'll have 50 new relationships after one year, you know, that could potentially send you work. And because, you know, you do a show with them, you talk for 15 minutes before you do the show, you talk for 15 minutes after, like now you've actually got a relationship and you gave first, you said, Hey, come on my show. And I want to promote your business. Of course, now you're on their radar. So I think that's an easy content play plus partnership play. <laughs> that, that is a, that's a beautiful strategy because it's, it's all give you're going first. It's win-win. Most people like free exposure. Most people do. <laughs> Most people do. Most people who are in business like exposure and they will likely promote the content you just created to other people. And um, yeah, that's a good way to do it. One of the, the most, a uh, very similar strategy that um, a guy named Chris brought up in one of my events, he does environmental remediation. So very different work, but mm. he also sees the value in referral partnerships. And in his world, those referral partners are civil engineers. So what he does is he'll hire a civil engineer to do something, a little bit of layout work, give me a, an erosion control plan or something, pay them $800 or a thousand bucks a few times a year. And that makes, that puts him in the situation where he is their preferred contractor because he is paying them, he's buying services from them, and they are going to refer business back to him. I know um, another one of my clients in the Northwest did this with a, an engineer for special um, structural engineering needs that he had. And then after he does that, who do you think this engineer is going to refer when a customer comes along? 
I love it. Yeah, yeah. it's a great but strategy. That's a great content strategy. It's it's again indirect, but get on a, a Zoom call like this, ask potential referral partners some questions. Hey, talk about your business. Share it on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Just promote. When you promote people, then uh, there's probably no better way to develop relationships with them. So that's that is genius stuff. All right. So that's the first category. Next category is we're an established contractor. We've been in business for say two to five years, but we want more consistent lead flow. What would you tell them to focus that 20% of their effort on to get the 80%? Yeah. So I think at this stage of the game, like assuming you kind of built those first few things off the ground, you got to be investing in your organic strategy. So blog content, you know, your website needs to be built out with service pages, portfolio. Um, and, And what we see is looking at all the digital channels, the best lead source for quantity and quality is generally organic search from Google, Yahoo, Bing. And so it's all about ranking organically. People have come to trust Google. They type something in and if they find you, they think, okay, this has got to be one of the best results um, out there. Um, And that's just how we've been trained. And Google's done a good job of providing good enough results that we think that. So um, having a content strategy is really important. However, this is where that like catch 22 is. I would really prefer you started that on day one because it's gonna take some time to build up, but knowing that you probably didn't have the time or maybe the dollars to invest in that early on, now is the time to get that going and and build that up. Um, And then anytime you need to add an accelerant to leads, I I look to paid, you know, search. Um, I think that partner strategy that we just talked about, like keep doing that, right? Like if you just formed, you know, 20 to 30 to 40 relationships, you know, every year through your podcast, you might be able to ride that strategy out for a long time, um, that alone. But um, going to Google ads, that's a way where you can say, hey, I'm going to turn on the jets. I'm going to pump a bunch of money in, but I can basically force traffic to my site. So I think it's a combo of those two things. My ultimate long-term strategy for people is to work your way off the paid and just be reliant on the organic. Um, And that's just simply from a cost per lead standpoint. But it's all, once you get into this phase, I feel like it's a lot goal dependent. So I'm tossing out some ideas, but it's very much, well, say in year three, you're doing, you know, a million or a million and a half, and you're trying to get to two. That looks different than trying to get to three or four, you know, in the next 12 months. And so it will somewhat be dictated by the goals. I think that the important thing is to go out to the right side of the page and operate from right to left. Think, where are we going? Don't just think, well, I need more leads. Well, you you could just create more of a mess for yourself. My advice would be to think, what do I want? Where do I want to be two years from now? What type of work is in my wheelhouse? What's profitable? Let's figure out where we can make money I think it would be a a tragedy to go spend money to get leads and then execute those projects and spend the next 18 months doing a bunch of work that you don't make money on and you don't like. So let's figure out what's actually working for you and then go get more of, of those things. There are buttons that can be pushed and levers that can be manipulated to get you what you want, but it's, it's really about being strategic. For sure. All right. Last category. We've been in business 10, maybe 20 years. We have lots of leads coming in. We have lots of referrals, but we want bigger projects or we want to grow into a different market. Maybe it's we're doing remodeling and we want to go into custom homes or maybe it's a different geography or something, but we want to we we want to make some changes to to that. Maybe these are a couple of different situations. So let's look at somebody who's a remodeling contractor. They've got a good referral base, but they want to get into new builds, custom homes. Let's start with that one. Okay. Yeah. I think, you know, whenever you're trying to reposition yourself, that's one of the bigger marketing challenges because now you've built up 10 years of brand equity of people knowing what you do. And now you're having to basically say, Oh, and we also do this different thing, but we're also really good at it, right? You know, all of a sudden. And so in a lot of ways, you're building up trust. And so I think your your content play there 
is all about educating people and showcasing that you actually are capable of those types of projects. And then it's a it's a subtle change in what you're posting on your website in terms of your project galleries, your portfolio, and also to your social media pages. Maybe instead of putting all of your projects up, you're only putting up the really high-end remodel projects. So maybe you do remodeling from 50K to 300K. Well, now you're only going to post the 200 to $300,000 projects because and you're going to get pro photos done. Maybe you're going to do some video. And so you're really, at this point, I think, starting to think about how do I elevate my brand? And you do that through visuals, photography, what you're posting, um, and then the education piece. So if, if we go back in time also to think about some of those other strategies, you might change up your referral partners and invite different people on your show or take them out to coffee or lunch or whatever it is. Um, and you're going to kind of shift, okay, who's this new audience? And then who are my other referral partners? What areas do I want to work in? And then everything is just kind of like, it's those micro adjustments. When you look at something like Coke or Nike and you watch their logo over 50 years, you know, and it's just all these micro tweaks. Mm. Um, I think it's that on a smaller scale, you know, where you're just making those adjustments. Yeah. So uh, a couple of thoughts there. Um, If you, let's say you're going after higher end clients. You want to go from $50,000 kitchens to $200,000 kitchens. I was sort of thinking, what are people interested in who are buying $200,000 kitchens? So maybe it's, you would talk about how to select your sub-zero appliances. Well, let's look at high-end appliances. What are they interested in? What are the the questions they have? Let's not, let's not talk about the, the builder grade plumbing fixtures let's go look at the high-end plumbing fixtures and go Mm -hmm. talk about these are the things to consider when you're going to put in sub-zero appliances because that will polarize your your audience and it will the people who are looking for builder grade looking for cheap stuff they're like i don't even know what a sub-zero appliance (laughs) is yeah yeah and you'll talk about more design than function you know and things like that yeah yeah so think about your client what are they interested in create some content based on that yep good stuff um what about so if you're going into a different market whether it's going from remodeling to custom builds that's not much different than going into bigger uh bigger projects what about a new geography if, say if somebody's in St. Louis right now, they want to go to, they want to get in on the action in Boise or Denver or Austin. How would, how would they start to get a foothold in those markets? Yeah. Um, I feel like it's very much go back to the startup business suggestions mm. because you're, you're in a totally new market although now you have one advantage or a couple advantages, you have a more powerful website. So you can build on that in terms of content and you can put, Hey, we have a division here and a division here. You already have testimonials. You all already have projects. Like you get to leverage all of that. And you, and hopefully at this point you have more resources, whether that's staff time or money that you can invest. But honestly, in terms of like boots on the ground, like you still got to find all the relationships. You got to partner with different people. You got to pick your targets for areas. And then you still maybe want to do some canvassing, get that first job, get some signage, get some trucks in there, like get the branding going in those very, very tight neighborhoods that you want to do more projects in. Um, So I feel like it's kind of a combo. You get the benefit of some existing resources but you still got to kind of have that, you know, grind mentality of like, this is totally new. Like we're not even driving distance anymore. We've got to, you know, start a lot of this from ground zero, but you maybe just get the lever in when you reach out to someone, it's like, Hey, we've been doing this for 10 years over here. We're just starting a division. So now that partnership has more credibility than, Hey, I'm a new guy. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. So let's talk about lead generation. If somebody were to ask you this question, Spencer, I need more leads. What's your number one piece of advice? Can you just do more of what's already working? And, and I ask this question to people that reach out to us and I think it's the best advice, even if it means not working with us, you know, if you're doing, let's say you do two open house events each year 
and you get 80% of your work from those two events. Like you, you do it up, you, you cater it, you pull in the whole neighborhood, like all this stuff. Can you do one a quarter? Can you do four of those? Like, if that's the answer, just do more of it. You know, um, sometimes we want to get super fancy and sometimes it's just a simple answer of like, or maybe paid ads on Google is working for you. Can you just double your ad spend? Hey, then you get double the leads. You know, does that work? Um, so I think that's, that's what I like to do. Yeah. That's great advice. What's working. Right. And if you've been, if you're in that camp of you've been in business for a while, like you should know. <laughs> what's yeah, and I, th- I think the, <clears throat> there's a, a tendency to get bored with our own marketing and we, we get shiny object syndrome and think, man, we should try TikTok or clubhouse <laughs> or the, the, whatever the, the fad du jour that's coming along the pike that, the guys like Gary Vaynerchuk and you know other people are talking about. And I think a good place to start, I love that. What's working? I, I, I've had those conversations with some of my clients and, and I'll ask them, where are you getting your leads from now? And it was, well, yard signs. Let's go put out some more yard signs. <laughs> go go place an order with your sign company. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it doesn't have to be new. It doesn't have to be complicated. Let's go find out what's working and find out what's not working. Flip those resources, that time and energy and money to something that is working and just double down on that. Um, it. What I found is marketing is if somebody comes along and says, all you got to do is this, then <clears throat> you should probably stay away from them because marketing is experimentation. It's a lot like uh, I listened to a great <clears throat> excuse me, great interview with uh, Tim Ferriss interviewing Jerry Seinfeld on Tim Ferriss's podcast. Oh, I should go check that out. Enough said, like, get those two together. <laughs> it, it's, it, it is, it's great stuff. <clears throat> you may be wondering well, who, what can I learn from a comedian? Well, Jerry Seinfeld has been a very successful comedian for a really long time. And he said, what makes a comedian really good is writing. They're really good writers and they're good at running experiments. So stand-up comedy is, hey, I'm going to write a joke. I think it's funny, but I need to get some real-life feedback. So I'll go stand up on a stage, say it in front of 30 or 40 people, get some data, and then go back and tweak it. Take it back out to the market, so tell the joke again, get some data and tweak it. And I think it's the same way with marketing. You, it's a, you have a hypothesis of what is going to work, but you have to get it out there, measure the response, adjust it, take it back out, and I see so many people who try something and it it didn't work and they just abandon it. And that's a mistake. That's just round one of the experiment. So I think you you have to think of it marketing as, as an experiment. And I know in, in, in my business, I started, well, frankly, when I started the podcast, I didn't really know, I didn't know what, what, who my audience was. And so I just started talking about things, finding out, getting feedback from them, talking about more things, seeing what resonates. So yeah, ask what's working, do more of that, tweak it before you jettison things. And yeah, definitely listen to that that podcast with Tim Ferriss and Jerry Seinfeld. A lot of good stuff there. Yeah, I'll have to go look that up. Yeah. All right, great stuff. Um, So let's talk about this book. And let's talk about what else you do. Obviously, you've you've written a book on marketing, but what else do you, what exactly do you do um, other than wear fashionable socks and have an in-depth knowledge of, I think, every Chipotle in the the state of Colorado? I think those are your one of your claims. You know, is that right? I've, I've at least, if nothing else, done a good job of branding a couple of things that make you, you know, think of something when you think of me. So yeah, I have been to all 73 Chipotles in Colorado. Um, <laughs> and we do have some fun builder funnel socks. And uh, <laughs> if you want a pair, just shoot me an email. We'll get some out to you. But, um, yeah, you know, my family's been in the, the building business for 110 years out in the Seattle market. And I first got into all this back in the Great Recession when we we're trying to figure out how to get more leads online. You know, when Facebook business pages were like the new hot thing, I know today it's TikTok and Clubhouse, but at, at one point in time it was Facebook. And uh, 
yeah, really just help them scale up their, their division from about 2 million to five and then ultimately over 10 million in sales. And she said, Hey, gosh, I think we are onto something here. I think we can help more people, um, figure this out. And so we started an agency and, um, just kept rolling. So today we do a lot of what we talked about today in the digital space. We help people create content. We work on their websites. We do some social for them. Um, some lead generation on their website. We're big fans of you having control over your lead generation um, mm. through your own domain, which is your website, your own content marketing plan. Um, and then you stay in touch with them through email. So we kind of put together a comprehensive package and and then we clip in as your your marketing team, basically. Gotcha. And where can people connect with you if they want if they want to do that? Yeah. So builderfunnel.com is the easiest way to go learn more and you'll see all the stuff we talked about today. There's content galore. And then you can um, click the apply to work with us if you're interested in exploring that route. Um, And then the book is over at remodelermarketingblueprint.com. And we're still doing some book bonuses too. So you can go get on Amazon, but go to the website and you'll see some directions on how to get the, the bonuses there. Even if you buy one copy, we're giving out some stuff. Gotcha. Builderfunnel.com and remodelermarketingblueprint.com to get that book. Yeah, this is good stuff. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to do that. How grueling was it, just for my own personal, <laughs> um, my own personal edification? How grueling was it to write a book? It uh, it was a little rough. I guess I, I'll put it in the medium category. So I I made it a goal of. S- knocking out draft one in three months. So Q1 of last year was my goal. Like get that done. The the more grueling part had I done it myself would have actually been the editing, like taking draft one to the finish line. Mm-hmm. And Q2, my goal was like, okay, I'm going to edit this thing and um, get it looking in good shape. And I got about two weeks in, I'm like, this is the worst. So I, I went out and hired a um, a hybrid publisher and worked with them on the rest of it. And they helped with cover design and, you know, all the the rest. So, um, that was, I was glad I went that route, but I also glad that I like wrote the whole manuscript and did that piece of it. And I don't know, you get up at four 30, you put in an hour and a half every day and you knock out 500 to a thousand words and you do that for three months and you've got it. It's, I wouldn't want to write like a, uh, a fiction book. I feel like this was probably an easier path than just like figuring out characters and stories, you know, cause you're talking about stuff you, you know. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. If you've been thinking about it, I would encourage you to, you know, <laughs> make the plunge. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a big elephant too. It is. Yeah. Eat. Um, been it was basically a calendar year from starting the first word to getting it on Amazon and out the door, you know, and that that's not helping my motivation, <laughs> yeah. but it's probably something that needs to be done. All right. Good stuff. All right, folks, check out the, uh, those links, go to builderfunnel.com, remodeler marketing at blueprints.com. Um, yeah. Follow Spencer. You're, you're on all the social media channels and, uh, this was great stuff. I really appreciate you going through the effort of, of writing the book and, um, and for being on the podcast, sharing some really practical stuff. Thanks Spencer. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And yeah, I hope some of these things, people can just take them and put them right into action. I guarantee they can. Thanks, man. All right. Thanks, Todd. If you're a project manager or a superintendent on a large construction project, and you're tired of chasing people down for daily reports, safety orientations, JHAs, or toolbox talks, here's some good news. Field Chat will chase everyone down for you by using scheduled SMS text messages or QR codes around the job site to collect the information you need. Start your free trial today at fieldchat.com forward slash edge and see how it feels to eliminate paper, data entry, and communication chaos on your projects. That's fieldchat.com forward slash edge. All right, be sure to check out builderfunnel.com. Go get your hands on the book at remodelermarketingblueprint.com. Check out Spencer's podcast. He's a great guy. I've known him for a few years, and he is super practical, super down to earth, and he will help you grow your business. As always, I appreciate the ratings and the reviews. 
Be sure to go over to buildermasterclass.com if you want to check out some of my resources. You'll get tips on eliminating chaos with change orders, how to streamline or maybe even eliminate chaos with your customer communication. You'll be able to learn about some of the master classes and mastermind groups and resources that I have available over at buildermasterclass.com. If you could do me a favor and take one or two minutes and leave a rating and or a review for this podcast, that would mean a lot to me. That helps get the word out there. And you know what? It's all it's always nice to hear some positive feedback. So if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. You can reach me at constructionleadingedge.com. You can contact me there. And as always, thanks for listening. I will see you next time. A happy customer isn't just revenue, it's a marketing opportunity. From Google to Yelp to Facebook, join the more than 30,000 small businesses already using GoSite to request, respond, and manage reviews, all from one easy-to-use dashboard. GoSite puts the power back in the hands of you, the construction business owner with a mobile app that transforms how you run your business by making it easier for customers to find, book, pay, and review your services online. Get started for free.